We're done. All right, welcome to our February meeting. So let me tell you a little bit about Rich. Rich joined the NHAS in 1999. He's been an active member, since then serving as secretary, membership chair in three terms as president. So, so you, have me, you have me beat uh, so far. He owns many telescopes and has participated in hundreds of NHAS sponsored sky watches and events over the years. Rich is focused mainly on visual astronomy, but has transitioned in the last two years into the dark side of astrophotography. Rich lives in Milford with his wife, Jean, and Cat Swift, who likes to help out from time to time while he's working on the computer. So without further ado, Rich, take it away. Thanks, Joe. And, and speaking of Swift, I, I fed her, gave her treats, so hopefully she's not going to make an appearance during this. So just be warned about that. Um, so I retired in 2018. and. I think what I do miss about work was doing presentations for clients at uh, events and, you know, sales meetings. So I always enjoy talking uh, and doing presentations. So, so all that to say, thanks to Joe for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to, uh, to, to speak again. And I'm going to share with you my journey, which started almost, well, I guess 20 years ago, based back in about 1999. This is not a show and tell in terms of showing you a bunch of pictures. We've got the Slack channel for that. We've got a bunch of things. I, I want to share with you what I've learned. Uh, a lot of the pitfalls, expectation sharing, giving you the information and ammunition in case you decide to endeavor into this field. There are many ways of getting started. Uh, and that's kind of what I want to talk about as you walk, walk you through that. But also not to make this just a, a boring thing, I've tried to inject some points where we'll get a laugh or two. All right, so let's talk about expectations. So, as I like to say, let's get real, or as when I've talked to Ed Ting before about astrophotography, his first words are, don't. Um, and, and in all joking aside, it, the reason is that it, it takes a long time to get to a point where you're doing these magazine quality images. Now, everybody's ability to learn, you know, is different. But, but for me, it's taken a long time. And, and that's one of the first points I want to make is that, you know, you're not just going to go out there and get these types of images right away. There's so much you have to learn to get to that point, which means that sometimes the mental commitment becomes more important than any financial uh, investment. Buying $10,000 worth of gear, but not knowing how to use it properly is going to get you pretty darn frustrated fast. So you got to have the right mindset that, this is a journey and it's going to take some time and you're going to make a lot of mistakes, but you're going to learn from those. And that's kind of the, the approach I tried to take, but it wasn't by coincidence. In, in my professional career, I dealt with technology all the time and many products that could be perceived as overwhelming. So if you tried to learn it all at once, you're going to drive yourself crazy. You know, some people use the expression, you know, how you eat an elephant. It's, it's one bite at a time. So it's kind of the same thing here where you got to have, uh, as you go into this, I found I, I applied the same approaches that I took the technology where I would focus on simple use cases. I would make sure I had proper training and I would gradually learn those fundamentals. And then you can apply those to, to more advanced things. Um, same, you know, same approach I took with my karate. I'm, I'm a third degree black belt, but I had to focus on the fundamentals and learn those fundamentals in order to apply that to more advanced self-defense uh, methodology. So that's the point I'm trying to make here is the process is important. Uh, tools are wonderful, but if you 
don't know the process or if you don't have a process, then all you're going to get is extremely frustrated. In this image you see up here of M31, that's two years in the making in order for me to, to get to that point. So I think we've probably all experienced this. I know I have. When you start to look at a new technology or you start to, to look at products or you think about you know, this, this hobby, there's a lot of marketing out there. You know, hey, you know, here's the latest, you know, camera, you know, buy this camera. It's going to cut down in your exposure time. So you, you get real excited about something. And, and then out of due diligence you're, or maybe Catholic guilt, you do a little bit of research on it to convince yourself mentally, yeah, this is something I, I probably should get. You end up buying something and then you figure out, gee, this is a little harder than I thought. I'm getting a little frustrated with this. I can't figure it out. Oh, but wait a second. Here's a new a new fangled tool that just came on the market that's going to solve the problems um, I thought I bought this object for. And what happens is that you end up getting into this vicious cycle. And why is that? Well, I argue it's because we live in an instant gratification society. And a lot of times, myself included, we haven't always wanted to do the hard part in order to, to reach some type of goal. We want the, the easy, quick fix. And I knew from the start, um, well, not quite, I, I learned early on that falling into this trap, I was gonna get nowhere. So I was very uh, sensitive to that, to that moving forward. And if I fast forward a bit, just to give you an example, this may or may not make sense, but with PixInsight, there's these new tools out there that do star removal. And it's the latest and greatest tool. Well, guess what? I'm not using them. I refuse to use them because I haven't mastered the fundamentals of understanding the process of what goes on in that star removal. So using that tool may not help me. So I, I would prefer to learn those fundamental capabilities. And that's kind of what I was trying getting at here is I've held to that approach, which I think is a reason why I've been able to be successful and it sets the stage for me to, to get more advanced. Now, a couple of years ago, or actually probably, gosh, more than a couple of years ago, it's probably almost 10 years now, my gosh, time flies. I did this presentation sort of in the same spirit with visual astronomy, what was my journey in visual astronomy. And you'll see here that one of the things I focused on was criteria and requirements. Well, guess what? There's a lot of similarities when you endeavor in astrophotography as well. This was some of the criteria that I'd always talked about with visual astronomy, but think about it for astrophotography as well. You know, do you want to go to remote sites a lot in order to do astrophotography? Well, if so, do you have the proper transportation? Do you have the proper vehicle? How long do you want to set up and tear down? Does it take you two hours to set up and in order just to even get to the point of image and then you got to put everything away after? Well, maybe that means you don't want to go to a remote site too much. You want easier access. Wouldn't it be nice if you wanted to just walk outside your house and click a few buttons and you'll be imaging? You know, these are the types of things that you, you want to give some thought about if you're starting to enter this field. Um, and even in terms of the objects to view, well, you know, what if you have trees in your backyard? You know, what if you have a lot of light pollution in your backyard? So of course, these are all things that, that you need to think about before you jump in. But contrast that to visual astronomy, there's really no difference. A lot of the same criteria exists, and that's my point, is you wanna give that some serious consideration. All right, so a bit in terms of just you know history and expectations, what I'd like to do now is walk you through some of the evolution that I did and the, the methodologies that I came up with. So over the years, there's basically three major areas. When I first dabbled in this in the late 90s, um, I basically focused on wide field. You know, Take a camera and point it to a wide portion of the sky, short exposures, try to get some constellations, that, that type of thing. Um, I had a capability for what's called piggyback. What piggyback is, is basically putting a camera on a telescope, ideally that has a mount on it that's, that's doing tracking. Um, prime focus, hooking up the camera directly to, to the telescope. I even dabbled with what was called eyepiece projection, which um, probably 
those that are about my age or close know know what that is and that's pretty hard and guess what i could never get it to work so i i definitely failed in that but this was all film based too so even before i start started using digital i have a little bit more detail on that later so then you know probably in the early 2000s or so i started to dabble in digital and you can see here this is where most of the level of effort has been over the years has been in that that digital phase um Things like a focal, which is taking a camera and putting it over an eyepiece so the camera replaces your, your eye looking through the telescope. Prime focus, mostly with a, a DSLR. Uh, again, more wide field and, and some piggyback. So this has been my primary method of use, probably about 60 to 70% of, of all the work I've done to date. And then more recently, around 2020 or so, that's when I started to experiment with, um, you know, the the uh, automation and and then lately um, the, with the CCD cameras, which I'll get into more detail later. So the point here is that I've evolved into, you know, older technology to some of the more advanced technology, and it's taken about you know twenty years to do that. In terms of equipment, in the same type of spirit here so early on with film basically nothing more than a tripod uh, a dslr i did have access to an alt azimuth mount with tracking so that was that was pretty cool particularly back then and then some point and shoot cameras uh, in the digital realm i started dabbling with unguided tracking so those were like 30 60 second exposures on a tracking mount but no type of guiding, uh, multiple telescopes, and then started to dabble with the, the post-processing uh, as well, because some of the images you took, you, you were able digitally to go through and use some tools. And I will talk all about those details a little later. And then finally to the modern era here, where you know now I have a setup where there's laptops controlling software, you're doing guiding, uh, automation, I will talk all about this in, in details later, along with updated equipment. So you can see an evolution here as well in terms of equipment. Uh, and yes, there has been numerous financial investments during the way, which we will chat about as well. And in terms of the, the optical train, you, you see how basically you went from very simple, nothing more than a tripod. This is a Olympus uh, digital camera, one of the first ones uh, that I was exposed to, uh, my old Minolta film camera. Uh, and then some of you may remember there was something called a stiletto focuser, which I actually used um, several times. I can remember Gardner Gary and Nils Wygant, we were in my driveway, Nils brought over a, a 10 inch Orion. We hooked up a camera to it with this stiletto and he got some great pictures of Saturn because that is used to focus the, help to focus the DSLR. And it, um, stiletto was great, uh, but as an, you know, a useless piece of trivia, uh, when the back and off mask came out, basically they put this fella out of business. Um, if we look into the mid 2000s, you know, you can see I evolved into the DSLR era. Um, I got my first camera. Gene actually bought it for me in 2003, a, a Nikon D100, uh, which I used for wildlife photography, but started to dabble in it with uh, uh, with astrophotography as well. The later years upgraded that to a 7100. But this is also the time I acquired the, the Teleview scopes, the mainly the Pronto, the 102, which I still have today, uh, and my Canon G9X, which is a point and shoot, which I was using a lot for, for a focal type work, um, but still no really you know deep, deep sky stuff just yet. Uh, and then in, 2020, that's when things kind of changed. And you can see this is where I did some serious upgrades. Um, and I'll explain a little later why, why that happened. But this is where you have formal mount with guiding the AVX mount, used back and off mass for focusing, um, another, a new telescope, some guide cameras, and then ultimately the recent purchase of the, the CMOS uh, camera, as well as a, a field flattener. So, uh, an optical train evolution as well from very simple now to, to more sophisticated with some automation. Just to give you an idea, um, 
this is the rig setup I had about, uh, this was last year's setup um, with a DSLR camera. Here's my D7100 uh, on, the, on the scope. Here's the laptop. Now, you, the keen eye will notice there's probably a pending disaster here, as you can see with the cables. Um, and yes, there were cable management issues. And yes, there were issues. I almost pulled this off the table one time, slewing. Um, so a lot of, I'll, I'll explain some of those landmines later, but this is a pretty good setup and I've been doing, I did really well with it, but there were some pitfalls with this uh, that I found mainly um, I had to change the batteries every a few hours. And then I found out that Nikon actually made a part that you could hook up to a power supply. So I wouldn't have to do that. Um, the guide camera, I'm sorry, uh, the guide scope here is actually from Shorty, which is my Obsession 15. Uh, it's a diagonal, and the guide camera here um, created a lot of stress on this cable. And it was also using what was called an ST4 connection, which is not as good for, for guiding. So we'll have some updates to that a little later. But this was uh, this is pretty good, and it's you know served me extremely well. Uh, but there were pros and cons to to both, which which I'll discuss. We've now migrated. Um, to what I have today. Um, in terms of cable management, you may notice there's a lot of, lot less cabling here. Uh, that's because this is now a hub and I uh, put in a hub to uh, shorten the length of the cables from my guide camera to the imaging camera. So that cable management issue uh, has, has gone away. Uh, this has been tested numerous times, a lot of stress slewing from one side to another, everything is, is working good with that setup. And then just a little uh, little bit more details here. So you could just see here's the hub. I've got my power supply for the laptop Velcroed here as well. That was another issue where sometimes it could get pulled off. And then what's nice about this new, newest camera is it acts as a hub as well. So now the, the guide, the, um, the guide camera plugs right in, so a very short cable, so that minimized a lot of risk of, of cable maintenance. So the point here is that there was a, a lot of learning, a lot of mistakes. I did have cable management issues, pulling equipment off the table, or uh, the camera hitting the mount, um, lot, lots of pitfalls. So the and so what I want to do now is, is talk a bit more about um, sort of the modern stuff and how I really got to a point where, okay, you know, I've dabbled enough here, I've played, I've learned, you know, now it's time to go leap in, dive in head first. So as, as Herb always would say to me, entering the dark side, which I did. And of course, entering the, the dark side did get me in trouble. Um, as you could see here, this was also the formation of the finance committee uh, so that money does not go into a black hole. And, and if we just reinforce this a bit, in the early area, you know, this is where I was kind of dabbling. And then I spent a lot of years learning various things. Uh, and then about 2020 is when I decided to make that leap. And that's been just where I've been focused now. But seriously, I want to emphasize that it's applying what I've learned and just going through that process, you learn, you apply it, you learn more, you apply it. This is a cycle that is never going to end. It's This is why you've heard me say things before, like this is a journey. It's not a destination. You're, I don't feel you will ever know everything about this. You're always, always going to be learning. That's where I am now. So why did I make that jump? Well, first... Um, with the formation of the finance committee because I, I bought an AVX mount without consultation. So that was the that was the formation of the finance committee. And now I'm limited to certain transactions under a dollar amount, unless I have to anything over, I have to go get approval, which I both wrote an excellent business case for the, the ASI 2600 uh, and the finance committee uh, approved that. So that was, uh, that was a, a very good, successful business case. I, I anticipate in the future, there may have to be some additional business cases, but not at this point. Okay, so why make this type of jump as well? It's basically to mitigate all the things that I had learned. So, so the issues like setup time, you know, 
I don't want to have to carry equipment out each night. I don't, I would like to be able to go out. Joe and I were talking about this earlier, be able to go outside, uncover my tripod, put the scope on, you know, get the scope realigned in a few minutes and, you know, check my focus and boom, I'm, I'm imaging. And, and actually that's what I did tonight before the meeting is I, I set up, um, I went out, set up the scope, took me about a half hour to get everything guided. I, I had to realign a few guide stars because I'm on a tripod still and the wind actually moved the tripod a little bit, uh, but it took me about 30 minutes and I'm actually imaging right now as we're, as we're having this meeting. <laughs> so that was a, a big motivation. Um, wanting to image, you know, the deep sky objects required guiding uh, up to this point and a, you know, a couple couple members mentioned this to me is that, you know, you've kind of exceeded what you've, what you've learned so far. You've got to, you know, to get to the next level, you're going to have to make some changes. And guiding was one of them. Uh, and that was a huge commitment. Um, I, I had dreams of automation. You know, I'd seen videos of people controlling their observatory. Excuse me. <clears throat> you know, controlling the observatory, controlling all the equipment. So I wanted to endeavor in that and see if there was anything we could do in that area. Um, I mentioned this to Joe and Steve before we started that I want to do visual while I'm imaging. Basically go out, get things started, and then pull out another scope and do some visual while, while I'm imaging because I, I still love vis visual and I, you know, I, I love to do it, especially when getting together with others, which was incidentally, which not would prevent that i could i could see myself uh setting up a sequence let it run for hours and then i you know drive to wi-fi or i you know go somewhere local in town or i have people over at my house and we you know have a little star party so this is all reasons why you know wanted to really try to to master this next section um plus as i've gotten older i've been more susceptible to the cold um it's pretty funny i you know, in the past, it wouldn't phase me one bit to be outside in sub-zero, but um, I'm, I'm sensitive to that now. So I'm, I'm, I'm really trying to do a lot of stuff remotely now. Um, and the same in the summer, too. You know, I'll be able to do some nice imaging in the summer, but, uh, you know, not with getting eat up by, by the mosquitoes. So what are the things that had to get done for that? Well, I had to learn guiding, and that was um, a lot of work. It's not as simple as you think, even with a tool like PhD2, you have to understand the process behind it. And um, Lynn and Herb were pretty relentless with me um, on, on my guiding, even to the point saying, why are you imaging? Your guiding sucks. You've got to fix that first. You know, you can get the photons at a later date. Um, some upgraded equipment. Um, I, I remember I mentioned that diagonal I had borrowed from, from Shorty. Well, I've since then gotten... Uh, an espony that is a straight through and that's less strain on cabling and it's easier uh, for a, a, as a guide scope. And plus now I don't, I can leave it with Shorty. So if I take Shorty visually, he's got his guide scope back and I think he's happy about that. Um, a lot of new tools, um, PhD2, um, Nina as an example. Um, so I had to spend a lot of time uh, learning new tools to get to that point, uh, particularly about um, you know, the automation capabilities, but automation isn't just the tool. Cable management was a big one there. Um, you know, I'm sitting inside. If I want to sue to something, okay, it, am I going to hit something? Is the cables going to snap? Or, you know, so I had to really get a lot of confidence that my cable management was good. And then ultimately, you know, a permanent structure. I'm on the way there. You know, I've got a tripod set up now that I leave out. But ultimately, uh, there's plans to put in a permanent structure, uh, like a, a pier, as is what I'm aiming for. So, you know, I mentioned some of the landmines here, I think, as on, on the previous side, but let's make sure we cover them. So, you know, I don't want to carry things in and out all the time. I'm 62. I, I can do it, but you know what? It's starting to get, you know, a little um, tedious, and I just would very much like to avoid it. Talked a lot about cable management. Um, polar alignment was something I had to learn as well. Uh, I've gotten pretty good at that. Um, I never thought about weight and balance. So, so for example, 
if I'm aligning with an eyepiece and then I put my camera on, guess what? The scope's out of balance because the camera's heavier in the eyepiece. So I had to learn tricks about, okay, balance it this way when you're doing the alignment, but then make a little mark so you know where to move the dovetail back so that when you put your camera on, it's weighted and, and the counterweight is correct. Um, I found out before I figured that out, I was, even though I was guiding, my guiding was, was off. There was little tracks in the stars and couldn't figure it out. And then I ran across something on cloudy nights where they talked about, oh, it's likely um, weight issues. And then when I looked at the PhD2 guide that, that Lynn recommended, sure enough, there was some verbiage in there about um, using one of their diagnostic tools. And if you get this symptom, it could be counterweight related. So sure enough, I was able to go back and figure that out. So now I have little marks on where I have to put put the scope based on if i am got an eyepiece in or if I'm using the, the camera. And oh, by the way, that was different from the uh, the Nikon D7100 DSLR to when I went to their more recent uh, ASI camera. Focus was the roughest part. What a pain in the butt I had with that learning. Um, with the DSLR in particular, because the tools I was using, I couldn't see a real-time view. Uh, and then based on the position of the screen of the DSLR camera, I'd have to get into all types of contortions to see the screen. And, you know, no wonder I was having, you know, neck pain or, you know, soreness in areas of my body. It was, it was really a pain. Um, but when, so um, I ended up using uh, a tool that did looping in order to see it on a screen. And that was able to, that and plus the, the back and off mask, which by the way, if Bob Gillette's on, I think Bob is the guy who recommended the use of the back and off mask and boy did the world change when I started using that for focus. Um, but now I'm at the point where with the, the ASI, it's very easy um, to, for me to get, get the focus. Uh, and there's even ways even improve it in the future, but but right now, um, very good shape there. But that was that was hard and very frustrating, uh, and to the point sometimes I didn't want to do it because I knew I would have to deal with that. Um, power. Um, so the D100 had about a two-hour battery capacity, so I really couldn't set anything to run overnight. Um, I basically had to pick an object and let it go, um, unless I was up and then I can go out and switch batteries, but the, the upgrades I've made here with the new camera. And if I do want to use a DSLR, I've got the power adapter now uh, that, that will run all night. Um, again, you can see here a lot more challenges that I had and guiding um, was tough to learn, uh, but their PhD too ha has some really good diagnostic tools to help with that. Plus, you know, great mentors always, always help there. Um, connectivity. So, my dream there was have a laptop outside and connect it to my wireless. And guess what? I was, I was able to do that. Um, in fact, I'll show you a little later an example of that. Uh, but so that allows me to sit inside like I am right now and actually have imaging going outside and I can connect to that computer to, to see how things are going at, at any time. This might seem, whoops, this might seem a little subtle, um, but it's important. There were many times where I would be setting up mostly in alignment and I would get really excited about it. Like I'm almost done and, you know, getting ready to image. And what do I do? I, I rush and I hit the tripod with my leg. Guess what? Had to start all over. So that's because my zealousness and excitement and, you know, getting to the point where I can start imaging, uh, you make simple mistakes. So I have learned to slow down and be very careful. Um, and just really, you know, just be focused because you could, the simple, you know, the simple errors can, can kill you there. Um, and then, of course, maintaining state between sessions. So, you know, does the, the mount maintain alignment? Well, the, the AVX will. You, you, there's a last alignment capability. Um, and then, so that's good. So that saves a lot of time. And then also uh, focus. I want to be able to not have to refocus every time. So I've I've kind of talked about some of these already, but this is just a, a nice way to show here are the issues that I was dealing with and here are the solutions that I did. So, you know, today I have the tripod I leave outside. I don't leave the telescope on it. I take the scope off, but I cover the tripod um, with a couple layers of uh, covering. 
Um, I am going to put a peer in, thanks to Mark Stobridge, who, who uh, gave me a peer a couple months ago. So that'll be a spring project. Um, you know, improved alignment. I've talked about some of the ways that, that I've done that. Uh, the cable maintenance. The hub is the big thing. That, that really helped a lot. Uh, the back and off mess would focus. But the point here is you can see a lot of stuff here that I've done over the past two years to get to the point where I am, uh, including, you know, particular software, Pixon site for post-processing. Nina is what I use for all the control software, uh, telescope, camera, and, and so forth. All right. So I want to, uh, and then the last thing here is just to talk about what I've mentioned a few times in terms of remote controlling the uh, the setup outside. So outside, I've got my laptop uh, in a, in a, covered in a plastic case. If it's really cold, I cover this with a towel to maintain the heat. Um, if you're not familiar, there's an astronomy platform called ASCOM. That is the platform that many tools connect to to do all the automation, the, the scope control, the camera control, guiders, autofocusers, and so forth. ASCOM is what makes all that happen. And then tools like Nina are really the user interface to that and, and connect to all the capabilities of that platform. So on my laptop here, I've got PhD2 running here. I've got Nina running. Um, and this was when I was using the, uh, uh, the Nikon uh, camera uh, software called Digicam Control that was controlling that. Uh, but on the, on the inside now, I've got a wireless capability connects to my hub and then at my desk, this is where I can do all the control. And as you can see too, I have a nice little helper that likes to visit me from, from time to time. Um, so she's she's pretty good and, and sometimes likes to, uh, you know, be a pain or help depending on what mode she's in. All right, so the last part I wanna talk about here is post-processing. I'm not gonna go into great detail here, you know, we could spend a whole meeting just talking about Pix Insight or Deep Sky Stacker, you know, many tools. But I want to just take you, the purpose here is to take you through the start to begin. So back in the old days, you know, when I was doing film, what did I do? Well, I developed film. <laughs> and you can see here's the results of that. This was uh, an attempt at the Orion Nebula Prime Focus uh, on my on my C8. Um and this is a piggyback shot of M31. And this one is a JPEG of the moon that I did a focal with that. Uh, um, the, at the time, it was a, a C2000Z um, point and shoot camera. And, in, and I also went back, I thought it would be pretty cool. I went back to my astronomy log or my photo log where I had the, the film prints and this, and I, I was happy. I actually took some pretty good notes here. So this was M13 at ISO 100. The F is for Fuji film. Uh, it was piggyback with a 50 millimeter lens. Uh, there's the date. Why well, I didn't do five minutes? I did four minutes, 45 seconds. And this was on the C8 alt azimuth mount. And that little dot in here, this little smudge, that's that's M13. That was my first shot of M13. And then. Um, what I liked about this one is that the note I made, because I was just trying to be so diligent, at, this was uh, a five minute exposure, but at two minutes, a car drove by. So that probably influenced the, <laughs> the photo, but this is M29. Not exactly sure where it is in here. I was looking for that little four star asterisk and maybe it's in that area, but uh, hey, it was film, ISO 400 Fuji film. So, um, as I transition out of film into digital, mostly in the area of a focal uh, work, uh, Registax came into play. Many of us here probably have used that in the past. Great on the moon, uh, good on the planets. Uh, so I, I used that for years. And then some folks, I think it was uh, maybe Bob Gillette put me on to auto stacker, mainly for the, for the moon. Uh, I would stack the moon photos and then use Registax wavelets, uh, but also, um, in a focal, I have a Sony camera, which I forgot the document, but I had a, uh, a Sony uh, camera. It had those uh, little tape cartridges in them. wasn't even It wasn't even full memory, so I would have. To, I had that actually attached to Abi, and I took a video, and then I transferred that video to my PC, and then I was able to use Registax to 
to get a picture of Saturn, a focal through Avi. This was a 30 second video. So, you know, kind of creative as, as you go through. Um, more recently, Ed Ting told me about this Microsoft image compositing editor. Uh, because when I started to image the moon with my ASI 120 mini, uh, I had to take like uh, 10 different movies because the field of view was so narrow and then you had to stitch them together. So I dabbled in that as well. And then when I started to get serious about deep sky objects, I, I would do, I would have unguided exposures, you know, two, three minutes, but they were unguided. Those end up being too much. So I had to bring it back down to like a minute. And then I ended up using this deep sky stacker tool which worked. I mean, I was able to get a few images and then I um, had access to Photoshop. So I gave that a try, but I really struggled with, with Photoshop. Um, and I was just really uncomfortable with it. And, and Deep Sky Stacker was pretty good, but I just didn't get the feeling it was going to scale to what I needed. So between that and, you know, talking with folks and struggling with this, I really decided I wanted to have one-stop shopping and then from financial expect, uh, expectation, I, I just didn't like the subscription model that Photoshop's gone to. I just think it's way too expensive. If I was a professional photographer making a living, hands down, that would be the, w the way to go. Okay, um, so that took me to where I am now. And because my desire was really one-stop shopping, I, I settled on PixInsight. A lot of people had recommended it. Uh, I took the trial. Uh, but I'm going to talk more about that in a second, what I did. But this is the the end result. There's M31, uh, about a three-hour total exposure for multiple data sites, uh, data sets using uh, my latest ASI 2600 camera and PixInsight, the processor. So I do want to mention a few things about PixInsight, but I argue this is applicable no matter what tool you're using. Any one of these tools you have to understand what's going on behind the scenes to effectively use them. Um, it doesn't make sense to apply a multi-scale transformation to an image if you don't know what the heck multi-scale transformations are and what they what their purpose is. You know, you're just guessing, and I suppose you could get lucky at times. But I took the, as I mentioned before, I took another lesson from my work experience. I sold complex tools, software development tools that teens would use. You just don't sit down and start playing with that tool. You've got to have specific use cases. You've got to understand some fundamental capabilities. So basically, I, I took upon that experience to my approach to Pix Insight, and I decided I have to master the fundamentals. I need to master some very simple use cases. So I went out and I found tutorials uh, that, ta that taught me that uh, on the Pix Insight site as well as YouTube, because it turns out that there's tons of stuff out there. So many people that have done really great work in this area. Um, so I, I decided that had to be the approach to, that I would take. I also invested in training. Um, I purchased M Adam Block's Fundamentals Training, which is really excellent. Anybody that wants to get into Pix Insight, it's worth the 180 bucks to, to take the Fundamentals Training. It's, it, that was really what, what got me going. And then all those YouTube videos were great supplements and, and to, for that Fundamental Training. So I'm at the point now where, you know, I'm probably enough to be dangerous. Um, I've, I've got the fundamentals down, my fundamental workflows, uh, but there's a lot more to learn and that's, and that's what I'll be working on. So we're almost done here. I just wanted to um, share some resources at the end here. Um, we've got a couple great shop talks about astrophotography in our own area. Of course, we got the Slack channels. Um, this was an area, this was one I used when I was starting to use my DSLR. So if you're using a DSLR, that's a great one. Um, a very simple video on how to use the back and off mask, which was simple and it was great. And that, that really helps me. Uh, PhD2 best practices. This is a great one. This walks you through in detail, both the method and the process. Uh, this one was really helpful for me in getting my guiding calibration and getting my graphs nice and smooth. Really really good best practices there. Uh, again, stuff on PixInsight, AutoStacker, Deep Sky Tracker, Matt Page, who I don't know if Matt's on, but Matt uses this tool, APT, uh, 
I personally have not used it. I know he raves about it. So this is uh, this would be analogous to um, using this versus Nina, which Nina is what I'm currently using. That's what I started off with. Um, so those tools are, are very compatible. Um, so what are some strategic operations here? Well, I mentioned the, that talk I had done in visual astronomy years ago, very similar. I mean, you're gonna have different equipment for, for different types of work. If you wanna image the moon, that's one set of equipment versus imaging a, a deep sky object. Different cameras, maybe you get away with a point and shoot camera uh, for say lunar or maybe wide field, uh, but a, you know, a, a CCD or CMOS for uh, deep sky objects. And don't forget this last part, crucial. You know, are you going to go portable? Are, are you going to be traveling to sites? I, I know Pat Flanagan, for example, he goes to YFOS a lot. He must have a very good process and feel very comfortable about packing his vehicle, getting there, getting things unpacked, image, and back home and, you know, not driving off the road. Um, it's, it's extremely important. Um, for me, I personally have settled on wanting to do most of my imaging from, from home, and I will probably do that, but I will do visual at other places. Um, I know we have we have the Titan at YFOS. Um, I've used that once, so that would be something I probably would be interested in as well, but I think I'm at the point where I probably am not going to want to pack a lot of my gear, go to, go to a remote site for, for imaging, but we'll see. You know, you never know what the future is going to hold. Um, I think most important is attitude. Um, I ran into many landmines. Uh, it was very easy to get down and depressed. It was very easy to just walk away, but maybe it's my stubbornness as an Italian um, that keeps me going. Uh, and so I, I will be persistent and found ways to, to overcome the landmines uh, to keep moving. And guess what? There's going to be more. You know, I probably don't know what I don't know yet. So I'm sure there's going to be other things I run into uh, as we go along. In fact, I know one right now with, with my field flattener trying to diagnose um, that the star is not pinpoint. There's either a uh, spacing issue or a tilting issue with the camera, which I need to, to troubleshoot. So as, as one example. So I, I think I mentioned this to, to Joe and Steve before we started, but you know what this experience has re really taught me is, is I'm very humbled. I think about what I'm doing and how 20, 30 years ago, people did this. I mean, people are in sub-zero weather, sitting outside. They're manually guiding their scope, looking through an eyepiece with, a, with one of those illuminated eyepieces, keeping it on the point star, freezing their butts off, or getting eaten by mosquitoes. I mean, that was hard work. So that's why there were a lot of people that probably didn't do it, and the ones that did were very good. And oh, by the way, you got to know your exposures, right? I mean, you might, you have, it's not digital where you can just bits and throw it away. You know, you're, you're, you know, you're buying film and you're going through and buying the right film for the right conditions. And so that's, you know, I, I think about things like that and it just makes me say how easy we have it today. And I guess I'm grateful for that because those guys were the pioneers that, that really let us get to this point. Um, if you let instant gratification rule you, you're going to be unhappy. Um, it is your enemy for certain. You, you must have patience. And again, this is me. Everybody's different. But for me, I have to be patient and I, I am focusing on the fundamentals. So I gave that example earlier in Pix Insight where there's these you know new you know, tools that have come out, everybody's excited about, I won't look at them because I don't feel I've mastered the fundamentals of what those tools provide. I have more to learn. And I always think that's that's a good route to, to take. You know, again, I'll, I'll refer to my karate. Um, you know, I'm a black, even though I'm a third degree black belt, I practice the same fundamentals of class every day that the white belts and the yellow belts and the lower levels start off with. Why? Because if I can't master that, then everything else is irrelevant. You know, if somebody throws a right punch at me and I think of a technique versus how to defend that punch, I'm screwed. 
So it's, you know, it's kind of the same thing here. You, you need to make sure, for, at least for me, I, I focus on those fundamentals and I, and I continue to, to do that. And finally, it is a journey. It's not a destination. You can have goals, but guess what? You reach those goals, you set new goals. And, and you, you iterate over that. So um, that concludes it. But I, I do want to call out some people here uh, who really have mentored me along this whole journey. Um, Herb Bupert, who's uh, there on the line, um, Lynn Peterson, uh, Ed Ting has been great. Uh, Lynn has been awesome. I, I call her the professor. Uh, she gives me homework uh, and, and I have to show her the homework. Um, it, it's pretty funny, but she, she's been awesome. Uh, I've known Gardner since I uh, joined the club and, you know, he's a great astrophotographer, a great imager, and he's always shared a lot of good, good hints with me. And, and then more recently, Matt Page has really helped me since I uh, got my new camera and he helped me early on with Photoshop stuff when I was really struggling with Photoshop. Uh, Matt is very knowledgeable. Uh, in that area. And then of course, down the bottom here, I do have the shout out at least the finance committee who has also made it possible. So that concludes uh, the presentation. Um, so we have questions and so, I don't know if anybody typed anything in the chat window as well, if there were any questions there, but. Rich, I'll, I'll start off. Um, sure. Uh, the picks insight. Yes. What did you do before Pix Inside? Did you use like the Photoshop? And and what was the change, you know, the before and after for for doing that? So I tried um Photoshop, but I just struggled like hell with it. I just didn't get it. Uh and it's because um I really didn't spend the time to learn the fundamentals of Photoshop. I I I think I tried to do the quick things and got very frustrated with that. So then I had to make a decision. Okay, I need to take a step back and do I fundamentally invest and learn all the fundamentals of Photoshop or is there something better? And I chose something better in PixInsight because PixInsight was specific to astrophotography. A lot of good documentation and it was also financial too. I mean, as I mentioned, Photoshop is a subscription-based model which I didn't want to pay a monthly fee for. Uh, Photoshop, it's one shot, or sorry, PixInsight is one fee and you can put it on, I believe, up to five machines. Um, so that was a primary reason. It was a huge financial motivation to go to PixInsight, but more importantly, because it had a good reputation. A lot of people were using it. I know people in the club were using it. Um, and I knew I would have access to resources. So that was the kind of the poor before and after with Pix Insight. Okay, very good. Any other questions, either type them into the chat or unmute or, or raise your hand. Yeah, Rich, Carl here. Hi, Carl. Uh, I'm in the very infant stage of astrophotography. I bought an older uh, uh, ZWO camera from Tom two years ago. And what I started doing was uh, aligning and imaging on let's say Saturn or Jupiter with an eyepiece and then removing the eyepiece and putting the camera on and then finding out that it wasn't even aiming at the same point. Um, so what am I doing wrong in a very early level? Uh, so that sounds like um, could be a potential, certainly a focusing issue. What type of Z ZWO camera do you have? Well, I don't have that with me right now. It's a okay. it's a black and white camera, and uh, I I don't have it with me right now, Rich. Okay. Do you do you know if it's uh, did it specifically say it was like a planetary camera? Uh, yes, it is. Yeah. So likely the field of view is going to be narrower than the eyepiece. That's one. Uh, two is likely focus. So how are you going to achieve focus? Well, is that ZWO connected to a laptop? Yes, it is. Okay, so you're using something like fire capture? Yeah, exactly. Okay, so um, you should be able to get an image on fire capture if your gain is, um, your gain setting may have to be changed in order for you to see the image. And, and the reason I asked about the type of camera, let me give an example. 
So I have a, a ASI 120 Mini that I use as my guide camera. I can use that camera on the moon and extremely bright. I could try to point it to Jupiter or Saturn. It's not as well. It's not really built for that. So you might be dealing with a camera uh, where you're going to have to bump the gain up in order to see the image uh, before you could achieve focus. But I would start off with focus and gain uh, to see if you can uh, see the image on the uh, on the laptop. Yeah, I think part of my problem too, Rich, is the fact that the mechanical movement of removing an eyepiece, adding a camera with the weight of the cables is, is a real issue too, you know? Well, that might potentially throw the scope off of balance, um, which I had talked about in terms of balancing issues. That's why it's um, probably we should follow up on this offline. I'd be happy to, you know, talk with you. Maybe we could even get together uh, at some point. Um, I know her probably has a lot of experience in this area as well. So, um, well, I think that's I think, right. You know, <clears throat> I've only done it four times, so I've <laughs> so I'm nowhere near uh, being able to repeat it. Yep. Every time I set up to do Saturn, I have a bitch of a time I'm trying to get it in the center of my camera, and yeah, there's lots of little tricks too. Like, uh, try to use the same eyepiece every time and see if you can mark, like uh, come to focus with the eyepiece, find the object. Once you find it with the camera, put the eyepiece back in and see what the difference is in the focus. And you can adjust the eyepiece in and out, maybe mark that spot. So next time you use the eyepiece to find your planet, um, you're gonna find it, it'll probably be blurrier, but when you put the camera in, it'll be in focus. You know what I mean? Well, I think another thing, too, is that when you have an eyepiece and you take it out and put the uh, camera in with or without a flattener, that you're changing your whole magnification and field of view, too. And I don't have right, right. I don't really understand that yet. You yeah, better be you're, perfectly centered. That's for sure. Yeah. Thanks, Rich. Like a, and you're, and like you're, you're changing that optical train. So from my experience, definitely focus will not be there. You will have to refocus. So. That's why I'm saying with your camera, if it's like mine, chances are it's a narrower field of view and you're going to have to bump the gain up to start seeing uh, an image on, on the screen. It's really trial and error, but let's, we should chat offline and see if we can help you figure that out. All right, will do. Thanks for your time, Rich. Carl, it's not easy, is it? <laughs> if her well, no. <laughs> no, it isn't. You know, I don't intend to uh, get to the same point Rich is now, but I want to uh, learn and understand the basic mechanics, which I have not mastered yet. So, and and that's a and that's that's a great start. And that's exactly what where you want. Do you have a tracking mount? Uh, yes, I do. I've got a CEM forty. Okay. Uh, if you can. A, uh... Yeah. If you can find it on uh, Astromart, is uh, was it Howie Glader? Was that the name? He made a one and a quarter inch, two inch adapter you could put in your diagonal, and then no matter what eyepiece or you put in, it'll always be centered the same. It, the way it was built, it would keep your um, your object centered every time when you change eyepieces. It always right. remains centered. All right, I forgot the name of it. It's called the. Uh, it, it, his name is Howie Gladder, or was Howie Gladder? Unfortunately, yeah, he passed away. Yeah, yeah, and uh, it's called the Paralyzer. P -A yeah, P A L L I Z E R. I own a couple of them. They're excellent. Yep, They're very that, helpful. Was, was that Herb that was speaking originally about that, or? Yeah. All right. Thanks. The Paralyzer. Yeah, I I have one of those too. I use for visual for culmination on on my jobs, and they are absolutely wonderful. The uh, any any other questions? Anybody else starting out in astrophotography? Anybody else considering astrophotography? Is uh, let me see, Rich. Rich, I I enjoyed this this presentation. I uh, by by the way, do you want to share your screen of your of your automated setup working? Well, that's what I was just trying to go here. Um, 
I had a session going. We Let's go. see. Yeah, we're going here. Um, whoops, sorry, hit the wrong button. So this is actually a session I, I have going. I, I got this imaging session going a bit before the meeting. Um, I'm currently imaging IC410, which is a also known as the Tadpole Nebula in uh, Arica. And this is Nina, and Nina controls everything, as I said. So here's my equipment setting. If I can go over to the camera, for example, um, cameras, the, my ASI camera, uh, it's a cooled camera. So it's, I, I set it for 10 degrees, negative 10 degrees centigrade. Um, you can see all the stats on the camera. You can go back to the imaging tab here and you can see what's currently being imaged in, along with the guiding because this connects up to PhD2 as well. And I noticed from my guiding here, I could just tell from this graph here for tonight, my alignment is probably off a bit uh, because I'm getting uh, some big gaps here. It should be more smooth like over here. So there's been a lot of, lot of corrections going on both in the RA and, and uh, declination axis. Um, and what I have going right now, this is called a sequencer. So uh, I'm currently, well, I'll show you what I had here. I started off this evening, I set up, you know, 12 images of the Pleiades, mostly a test. And then I added a new target, IC410, and that's what it's currently working on. So it's uh, got 24 or 50 exposures. I'm doing three minute exposures. Um, a lot of neat stats here tells you. I could go ahead and add another target. And then if I did that, then when it's finished with IC410, it'll slew to scoop all, all automatically, do what's called a plate solve, um, and then restart the guiding and the imaging. So what I've used this for is to say, set up a sequence to run overnight, and then I go to bed. And then the next morning, if everything worked, I, I have uh, subs of three or four different objects, depending on how many I, I assigned. And again, I only got to that point because I had to solve a bunch of problems before then. Uh, yeah, and it, you know, sometimes I still get a, sometimes yeah. I still get a little nervous about the cable management, <laughs> but so far so good with the changes Rich, I are made. You doing, uh, are you running heaters tonight too? I am not running heaters. Um, should I be? I I really haven't I learned know. about that. Is it? So, so Rich, this this took a lot of learning to to get to this point, to to get this program up and running, and to make each of these windows work. Yep. I have to presume each one of these tabs and each one of these windows is a learning curve and in trial and error and experimentation. In in, in some of them, yes. Um, in others, no. But the what makes this all possible again is Neen is the tool, but ASCOM is the platform. So whether if you're using APT, whether if you're using Nina or some other tool, they all typically tap into that platform. And it's really, you know, all this information like that, the, uh, if I go back to camera, for example, you know, all these information about the cameras coming from ASCOM because there's a camera driver interface that, that it uses. Uh, if I go to uh, t t telescope, it uses ASCOM to control the scope. So I've got my Celestron driver here because I'm using an AVX scope. But if you had, say, uh, you know, a Gemini or something else, then there's other drivers supported by ASCOM uh, that you would connect to to control your scope. So, and the same holds true. I do not have a focuser, but if I had an autofocuser, I could make it control there. Um, the guiding, I'm using PHD2. This actually was, was not too bad from a tool perspective. In order to understand the guiding, it's where a lot of work was done. And I could tell tonight I definitely have some issues here. So I am I know from experience and learning that my alignment is probably off a tad. Uh, will it affect my images a tad, but probably not enough where they won't be usable? You know, I can go to the image tab and we could look at the last one. So here's the last IC410 it just took. I can go back and look at another one. So you notice a change? I'll bet your clouds have started to move in a bit because this one is fainter, is fainter than than this one, and some of the earlier ones before the meeting, um, I actually was seeing some of the red of the of IC four ten, like in this one. So it's probably you know a little hazy out there since we, you know, I can go out and get up and look, but um, 
obviously I'm not doing that right now. Um, oh, by the way, here's the uh, one of my visual targets, uh, the leafy minnow. That's that little five-star asterism in a Riga. Uh, the flaming star is out of the field of view down in this area, but you could actually see a little bit of red. This is just one sub. But regarding, yeah, this uh, is heating. Regarding heating, Rich. Yes. Uh, it's currently forty-two degrees outside. It's uh, it's pretty balmy. Yep. I haven't read about when I should be using that, so I need to. That's an area I need to definitely do do some homework with. Oh, I want to show you something cool here. Um, so this is in, in Nina. This is called the Sky Atlas. So um, I can pick an object. How about uh, M eighty one? And it'll show me, and it shows me on the atlas here when's a good time to look at it. So you can see this is it's pretty good in the sky right now. And if I click this add to target, uh, this the. Uh, images here were in the way. Notice now I have another tab here called M81, just added to my sequence. And what I can do is when I'm done, when it gets to this point, if I turn this on, it'll slew, it'll slew the scope, it'll center it doing what's called a plate solve, and then it'll restart guiding. And then for imaging, let's say I want, uh, I want to do 20 exposures at three minutes, which is 180 seconds. So when the current sequence is done, it's working on 410, it'll just automatically work on 81. And then I could add another one. And that's what I do if I want to set up a sequence to run overnight. And it even tells me, you know, the projected time so I can set up things so like I'm done at 630 in the morning, for example. So another cool thing with, that's another cool capability of Nina. So I guess this is turning into a little demo for that, which I had not attended. But as long as you guys aren't bored, it's fine with me. It, it is cool. Any other questions for Rich? Rich, thank you very much. Uh, most enlightening, most entertaining, and, and most informative also. So I really, really enjoyed this. And, and thank you for, for, um, for doing this. And thanks again, Joe, for letting me present. Because I, as I said before, it's nice to be able to do some presentations like this once in a while. Right. The one thing I missed from work. <laughs> <laughs> might, might have you come in later this year. We'll see. All right. I am going to stop the recording and switch over.